Hello and welcome back to the port. I'm the Gav Major and this is Amity Reports, your submissions with my commentary. Now this is a submission from Eternal Abyss, playing the Tier 7 Premium Cruiser Wichita. It's a Tier 6 and 7 game of Domination on Crash Zone. On the enemy team we have Double Akasuki, Benson, Yudachi, Kangaroo, Boise, Charles Patel, Ragnarok and John Barr. Now each battleship is teamed up with a cruiser and then one of the divisions is also teamed up with a Kangaroo. So spawning at uh, Alpha, they're asking support from the battleship, basically telling the battleship to stick with us or else you're screwed. Um, it's not normal to get five destroyers per team at tier seven. Uh, the matchmaking rules usually limits it to two. However, when there's an abundance of destroyers in the matchmaking, it will make a match with multiple destroyers rather than uh, making smaller games. Basically, if you have the choice between being in a 6v6 with only two destroyers per team or a 9v9 with five destroyers on the team, I think most people will probably go for the 9v9. And also, lots of destroyers in the game, it's very reflectant of the kind of naval engagements that you would have expected to have during the Second and First World War. So, um, at the moment, what they're doing is what I'd call an approved maneuver. So they're heading towards Alpha, but they're not going to rush into Alpha. Uh, they're going to go around the back of this island, use the island to obviously get closer to Alpha without being detected or spotted. And then also when they come at the other end, they can use the island to um, almost dictate their engagement. They can use the islands to um, block off shots from multiple targets while they pick on a single target or um, other, other such methods. Now looking at the minimap, Alpha's been captured and uh, two, the two battleships have been spotted. So therefore we know where the heavy units are and remember the heavy units were divisioned up so we know the two divisions are over at Charlie and Bravo. Therefore we kind of know that there's going to be three destroyers here. So there's the Akasuki on the right there. And now we're spotted so there's something else also up to our front here. So spotted and targeted, got the sonar on already as we come around the corner. There's a Benson, there's another destroyer off the left. So as predicted, we've got all three destroyers here. Akasuki's find out all of its torpedoes, bringing the guns to bear on the Akasuki. Now a friendly destroyer has already died over at the Charlie objective, meaning that um, first blood has already been awarded to the enemy team. So got the ship down at quarter speed and picking on the Akasuki. So feathering that throttle, making sure that you're not going at the same course and the same speed, making sure that you're harder to hit with torpedoes. Um, if you keep doing those kind of things, especially in these cruises where you do have fast acceleration and decent rudder, you do improve your chances of being able to dodge torpedoes. So he finishes off the um, Akasuki. Now he's got to deal with the Benson up to his front. Benson's launched torpedoes, so this is going to be quite a difficult one to dodge. He should be able to just flick it round, but there's torpedoes off to his right, so that's not the Akasuki, that's got to be something else. And being we know that the Kagura is in division, that's got to be the Udachi. Uh, Benson's got another volley of torpedoes out, and even with the best ability, he's still going to get one. And there's another torpedo coming in, and that's a Udachi torpedo, so ooh, that's going to hurt. Uh, got his radar on and this shows the, um, the beautiful animation of the radar on the PlayStation Pro. And he's just picking on the Udachi. But he's only got five, uh, seven seconds of radar left. He's already used the repair party. He's already used the damage comp. He's already used the sonar. It's not going to be long until he's all out of his bag of tricks. But he's managed to get two kills and the close quarters medal. So again, keeping that throttle, um, feathering it, changing it, making sure that it's staying unpredictable. But we kind of know that the Udachi has already used his torpedo reload booster by the multiple waves of torpedoes that came in from the Udachi. So now he's turning around. So what is this one? This is Akasuki, which is down to, um, well, not a lot of health. So there we go. Dispatch number three. Enemy destroyer blown up. So swinging it around. Thank God for the repair parties on the witch turn, or else I think Eternal Abyss would be gone by now. But this is the thing, this is the kind of progression you need to show when you come up against destroyers, just to get rid of them as quickly as possible. Uh, and this should be kill number four. Yep, there we go, kill number four. So, oh, time to relax a little bit, I guess you could say. So, um, that's 43,000 damage and a close quarters medal. 
and we're not even five minutes into the game. Oh no. Okay, the Udachi still have torpedoes left. Get that turned in. Ooh. Okay, we're alive. And we got using our second and last repair party. So as Eternal Bliss catches Alpha, that has been one hell of an engagement. And already you can look at the teams and you can see that the enemy team have lost five ships in rapid succession there. Uh, well, looking at the minimap, the enemy team is mostly focused around the Charlie objective and therefore it's going to take a little bit of time for Eternibus to sail over there. So we might as well cover off some of the things that he's done with this ship. So ship modules, he's gone for aiming systems, propulsion module, concealment module and main battery module. So it's slightly different to mine. Which is good, obviously. Um, it's good that people try out different things, and I admit that even mine, but what I choose suits me, it may not suit everyone. Now, he hasn't got any boosters fitted uh, for this game. Commander wise, he's got normal Scott, level 15, legendary 2. Uh, skills he's got is uh, Burn It Down XXL, Igniter, Armed and Ready, Fixated, and Refill Station. So he's got um, very high improved fire chance um, he's also got um, but improved reload speed really as well uh, he's also uh, got the inspirations of Madden Mastery 17 and Mikua Mastery 10 so obviously focusing on a bit of concealment just to try and maximize that um, that kind of engagement where if you bring your concealment down uh, it improves your chances of being able to dictate an engagement be able to just say, no, nah, I don't want to do this engagement and just break it off and drop down to your um, your detectability when you're not firing. Um, now here, uh, the smoke screen got laid across his front, which is really helpful. So that's a really good play by that destroyer. I haven't caught what it was, um, but he's picking on the Ragnarok and the Ragnarok is known for being a weak ship, especially if they have the um, Chaos Commander then what you'll find is they actually take a lot of damage from high explosives. Uh, now, Tenebris was briefly spotted there, so he's got a volley of AP coming in for the Ragnarok, so clench your teeth, this could be vicious. Oh, thank God it missed. So uh, going back to what I was saying is if they've got the Chaos Commander, they take excessive amount of damage from high explosive if it hits the superstructure and things like that. So that's probably one of the downsides of that. That Ragnarok doesn't look like he's got long left. And he's gone, which leaves the Kagaru and the Jambar. And he's got about a minute in this smoke screen, which leads me to believe that it is an American destroyer smoke screen. So there's some torpedoes coming in on the Jambar, and the way that they're hitting, I would say they're Probably Japanese, but he's got his first fire on the Jambar. Up to 57,000 damage, and the enemy team is massively outnumbered. Now he's spotted, so this means that the Kagaru is close enough to detect him when he's firing the smoke. So that's obviously a bit of danger. So you obviously get your radar on. There you go. If they're close enough to see when you're firing the smoke, they're close enough to be within your radar range and dispatched and cracked and unleashed. Here come the torpedoes, but it's too little too late from the Kagaru. Um, by spotting the um, Eternal Business Wichita, he basically signed his own death warrant. Uh, there's the high caliber medal as well, as the Jean Bar burns up. Could be looking at, no. Fortunately, uh, almost missing out on that sixth kill. Oh well, time to go to the end screen. Kraken Unleashed, High Caliber and Close Quarters, 5 kills and 78,000 damage, all in all a very good game. Uh, going on to the team results, as expected, Eternal Bliss is coming at the top of his team, especially having ground out all those kills, um, literally killing every single destroyer on the enemy team. Um, so, I hope the uh, the Turpits is very appreciative of that, <laughs> I guess you could say. And then going on to the economy tab, um, managed to make 375,000 credits um, with premium, uh, would have made 194 credits uh, without premium. And now there were no credit boosters during this game and you can see that the ship service costs even for a tier 7 premium is 166,000 credits. Um, being able to make uh, quite a decent 
penny across the board, uh, which is all very nice, very nice. So now for some bonus content, uh, this is Eternal Biz playing his Yamato for the first time uh, and it was played at 1am UK time but I would consider that to be peak time over in the Americas, Canada, United States, Mexico, South America, Caribbean so I'm surprised that the wait time took so long and when we do get into the game there's only actually 5 ships per team um, it just seems a little strange to me really uh, however it is a Legendary in Tier 7 game of Domination on Greece. Uh, on the enemy team there is a Fletcher, a Wichita, a Turpitz, a jean Bart, and an Iowa. So it's quite interesting. You can see that on um, Eternal Bus's friendly team he has two destroyers. So he spawns in the centre and although he generally starts to move over towards the right um, to obviously support his right flank, um, he does end up usually playing about this central location. Now um, he's having a little bit of connection issues at the start here, now this is usually due to um, internet glitches, um, when the internet slows down uh, below the capacity of the game, uh, well, it can actually transfer the information to and from the server. Now although 1am in the morning for the UK isn't peak time for um, like public use um, it is usually peak time for like private use um, basically because it's not peak time uh, other systems start kicking in like servers back backing up and updating um, laptop updates and things like that because uh, currently in the UK with the uh, COVID uh, lockdown we are seeing a lot of people working from home um, so that's just it's just one of the um, natures of the beast at the moment. Uh, so briefly spotted by the turpits and the first volley falls a little bit short uh, simply because the turpits is accelerating and legging it away. Um, now this is a nice way to share that the Yamato is not invincible. Um, she can be hurt very easily um, so that's something to always take into account. Um, she can be damaged, she's not invincible basically. Uh, however, one of her advantages is her gun range. You can see that in the mini map. It almost looks like if you park the Yamato in the center of the map, you'd be able to target pretty much everywhere in the map except the four corners. Also, uh, the other one the Yamato patches is she does come with 18.1 inch guns. These are the largest guns in the game, and therefore they're pretty much able to overmatch most armor. Um, that includes battleships. So if you're a battleship and you're up against a Yamato, do not be broadside on and do not try to bow tank it because that's going to hurt you. Um, and there's some good examples of that later in this game. Now uh, the modifications that Eternobus has taken is uh, aiming systems, propulsion mods, target acquisition systems and main battery mod. Commander, he's got uh, Takia, Tagia, I guess you could say, uh, part of the Japanese, uh, that Iowa is broadside on and is in for a world of pain. Um, now, his Tagia is uh, rank 16, version 3. Uh, his skills are flam flammable cannoneer, gyrating drill bits, marksmanship, reaching out XXL, and will rebuild. Inspirations wise, he has Cunningham Mastery 12 and the Azura Lane Hood at Mastery 16. Uh, so you saw there that he was able to get assisted out on the broadside Iowa, uh, scoring him about 35,000 damage with that volley. Now looking at the minimap you can see that most of the enemy team has kind of balled up in the centre with at least the Wichita and the uh, enemy Fletcher actually pushing into the objective. There we go. So it's almost, um, because they've balled up in the centre, it means that it's very easy for Eternal Bliss to actually angle himself against the enemy battleships because they're all in the same location, there's no crossfire. Uh, there's the enemy Fletcher spotted, we lose two ships from our team, however, Fletcher is able to be dispatched with seven overpens, giving him the high calibre and devastating strike. Now, that's one of the things with the AP, even though it's going to punch straight through a destroyer, it's the overpen damage is going to be quite high, especially if you're getting seven of them. So that's why he's able to actually dispatch the um, Fletcher. Now there's the Iowa, he's trying to be a clever bugger by faffing around with his propulsion 
Um, uh, however, Terminal Boost has pretty much read exactly what he's doing, and therefore I was now being caught broadside on, and is easily dispatched by the 18.1 inch guns of the Yamato. So that's two ships lost per team. That's the Vanguard and the Fletcher lost from Eternal Business team, and the Fletcher and the Iowa lost from the enemy team. Now this Wichita is pushing in, and it sounds really weird, but he's angled, um, and because he's angled, that probably puts him in quite a bad position, because he will just be overmatched by the 18.1 inch guns. So he gets uh, Eternal Business gets three overpens and two penetrating hits. Now, strangely, at this range of about 7.4 kilometers, being broadside onto an IOM may actually be a good idea on a cruiser, considering that with that volley, everything overpens, so you're only looking at overpen damage. Because if you try and bow tank the Iowa, uh, if you try and bow tank the Amato, which the uh, which is doing next, um, obviously it's all down to a bit of RNG, Jesus, but because he's bow on the his bow will be completely overmatched by the caliber of the guns of the Amato, and therefore the shells will actually detonate inside the ship like as per. And so, amusingly, um, the single detonator did as much damage as the five overpens. However, being bow on does make you a small target, so you are kind of relying on the enemy's dispersion and accuracy to um, be a factor in how, how much damage you take. And here he just fires off, and he's got one turret there, so I think he just fires it off just to make sure his guns just reload at the same time. So there's two ships at the side now, with the Wichita now gone. And that's uh, still on the enemy team, all that's left is the Turfis and the Jean Bar. So the Turfis is brought out on, so it's quite surprising. These people have got tier 7 battleships and they just keep sailing broadside on to the, the ship with the largest caliber guns in the game. Now, uh, this is quite interesting from the aspect of that um, it demonstrates how the Yamato has to be quite broad, uh, have quite a wide stance in order to bring all her guns to bear on a single target. And also it shows that the, the Yamato is not invincible, she can take damage from her uh, from multiple angles, I guess you could say. It's not, the, the damage is not massive damage, in, it's all coming in penny packets, but it does stack up. Now, again, the Turpitz was uh, brought side on, but the Turpitz decided to realize that brought side on is not working and uh, it needs to uh, almost come in and angle a little bit. Now, um, it's worth drawing your attention, the Eternal Base is now up to 196,000 damage, so he's going to be passing the 200,000 damage mark any second now. So, that's passed that milestone, and the Turbis is now starting to bow tank the, the Amato. So, I mean, he started to realise that being broadside on isn't a good idea, however, by being bow on, um, it just means that Eternal Bis is able to actually really hurt him. And there we go, dispatched. Uh, giving Eternal Bis his fourth kill. So there's the Jean Bar behind him. And the Jean Bar is what, on three quarters health versus a one third health Yamato and the Jean Bar suddenly decides to go broadside on to try and dodge the torpedoes as the Dachi is doing the right thing, he's forcing the Jean Bar to make manoeuvres that he really doesn't want to do and um, his Enobus is pretty much able to half the amount of health HP that the Jean Bar has. Uh, one thing you'll notice um, from the little zoom ins that we get here is that the Jean Bar has actually lost one of its turrets, therefore it's not able to use its reload booster but also it only has one half is DPM left. John Barr tries to bow tank, but like I've said before, he's just going to get overmatched. And there we go. Also, John Barr said castrate him off his second turret. Um, denied the Kraken by the Yudachi, but it is what it is. So here we are at the end screen. So 250,000 damage. Denied the Kraken by the Yudachi, but. Four kills, devastating strike, and high caliber. Only three citadels, so it just shows 
it was about how it wasn't really the system was doing the damage but it was just the amount of hits he's getting on target we're looking at 83 i mean that's pretty good uh only five ships on the enemy team he was able to obviously pick out pick them out um focus on the the higher hp ones uh, like the iowa the turpits and the jean bar um i don't want to sound a bit cruel but when we jump over to the um team results you can kind of see that the rest of the team on the Eternal Abyss were, they were more like a screen and a distraction for him rather, rather than really um, doing, uh, like massively assisting. Obviously they're doing the spotting, which is fair enough, but um, you can just see that he's managed to earn a substantial amount more ship XP. Um, of course on the team results table this excludes boosters and excludes being any kind of premium ship or anything like that. So he's able to really hone it in, I guess you could say. Uh, then going on to the economy tab, this is going to be the interesting one. So a legendary ship, you can see that ship service cost is 261,200 credits. If it wasn't for premium, even after that substantially gets substantially good game, I mean, he, he's really try-harded, he's got a massive amount of damage, he would have only made 23,212 credits if he didn't have premium. So this is going to be really highlighting the the economy of a legendary ship. Even if you have an ex extremely good game, um, you're not going to be making a lot of money. So if you have just an average game, you're going to be losing buckets of money. So legendary ships are going to be something that you might just treat yourself to once a week. Um, but with premium, he's able to make 165,000 credits. Um, now made quite a decent penny all across the board which is all quite interesting well if you enjoy this kind of content feel free to subscribe and if you are already subscribed then thank you very much guys if you enjoyed the video give it a thumbs up much appreciated if you have any of your own game captures that you'd like to submit for c trials or amity reports um the our email address is down in the description along with the commander builds and the ship modules of both of these games that eternal Abyss submitted um now, if you need any help with submitting games, always just drop a comment and I'll see whether I can give you any help. Until next time, I'm the Gallifer Major, and back to the port.